Good afternoon and welcome to this, our last in the webinar series for the summer. Today, we're gonna to talk about what COVID has re revealed about housing in New Hampshire and about transportation and about the link between the two. I'm Robin, I'm with Plan New Hampshire, and I'm so glad that all of you are here today. I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. Sylvia Von Aluk is the Executive Director of the Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission. Scott Bogle is a transportation planner with the Rockingham Planning Commission. And George Regan is with New Hampshire Housing. Next, please. I'll get better at that. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out and thanks to Brian Pratt, who is our sort of Wizard of Oz behind the scenes here, who's making all the technology work. And to Fuss and O'Neill themselves, Brian's at Fuss and O'Neill, who's an engineer there. And Fuss and O'Neill has been generously letting us use their GoToWebinar platform all summer for these webinars. I also want to thank Kathy Porter at LaValley, Amanda Savage at North Branch, and Fred Richards at the Masiello Group for their support during the, the pre preparation for this presentation today. Next. This program has been approved for AIC credit, CP credits 1.25. This is the program number here. And as a reminder, please mute your audio and turn off your video. And if you have questions as we go along, we're not gonna we're not gonna stop until the very end for questions. There is a question box over in your menu, and you can type in questions there as we go along. And we have and Brian will be um, taking a look at them, and we'll be reading some of those at the end to really start a really what I hope will be a really great um, discussion. Next, please. Okay, so Sylvia is going to talk a little bit first about what's the situation about with COVID. Right. Before Scott and George and I um, go into our focus topic areas and presentations, we just wanted to show a little bit about COVID and where we are. So as of August 3rd, the graphic here on the right showcases the all of New Hampshire and the darker the color, the more cases. So you can visualize not only our population centers and our transportation corridors, you get an idea of just how far and wide this um, has spread. Next. Uh, so how annoying already. Uh, gra I, uh, <laughs> a slide with a lot of numbers, but let's take a look because these numbers are really important. So again, as of August 3rd. The numbers are so important. If we look at the age groups um, to the left there, ranking all the way from zero to 80, we can see the infections, the hospitalizations, and the deaths. So getting into some specifics, the number of cases if we group the 30-year-olds and to infant, it accounts for 23% of the cases but only 0.5% of the deaths. The 30 to 59 year old group accounts for 43% of the cases, but just 4% or so of the deaths. And the real, the real crisis here is the 60 year old and above age groups accounting for 34, just a little over 34% of the cases, but 96% of the deaths. Next. If you don't like numbers, maybe perhaps a graph is a little easier. So this showcases uh, the, um, the number of infections in those different age groups uh, in the blue bar, but that red line indicates the rate per 100,000 persons, and you can see why seniors are um, at such risk. And now George will start. Thank you. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, and I just want to say thank you to Robin and Plain New Hampshire for inviting me to participate with uh, with Sylvia and with Scott to talk about um, the sort of short, medium, maybe long term impacts of the pandemic on housing and transportation. I think for me, when I was asked to to talk about this, is one of the things that I sort of noticed was that it's hard to really know that those sort of long-term effects of what the pandemic is doing, especially with housing, um, 
but certainly there's some interesting things that are that are happening that we're going to try to delve deeper into as time goes on. Um, but I think the first thing that's important to know is that, you know, even through this, we've had a strong economy. Um, this is a, an article just a week or so ago from Foster's talking about, you know, the record levels of home purchases in the seacoast um, that's really topping sales from even a year ago. So, you know, we've come into this pandemic in a strong economy um, with heightened demand for homes uh, for both purchase and for rent, which um, has been an issue before and an issue now that this sort of impacts you know the affordability and availability of people to be able to find places that they want to want to live um, and it certainly has continued to have an impact on workforce recruitment so just taking a look at you know the market as it was just so we know and have some context this is the media um, the multiple listing service for the median sales price of homes in in new hampshire so the the sort of goldenrod uh is the trend line and we've really seen um housing continue to climb all through a really strong economy and this is about um i think june june sales and so um we still saw the market going up to about three hundred twenty thousand dollars as a median uh purchase price um, the top of the market before the recession was about 245,000. So, um, you know, a lot of the demand, limited supply, and we hear stories of uh, people overbidding for ho for housing um, to purchase. Um, and then this is sort of what the current listings are. The the black line sort of shows total listings, um, and the um, the blue line um, ends up, or the teal, I guess, is homes that are being sold for less than 300,000. And I think it's important to note that because we're seeing now fewer homes that are available for 300,000 or less, which is kind of the entry point into the market. So what does that do? So we've before pandemic and, and now we've got people who can't really move out of their um, maybe rental into the ownership market um, because again lower inventory of homes and even less so of ones that are under 300,000 and from New Hampshire housing's perspective that's certainly a focus area for us um I'll talk later about how that's you know maybe different markets for different people and so um you know this is an interesting time you know the um the eviction moratorium has has gone away um and you know the first of of august is that first time that we've seen that what might be some of the impacts of, of people that are out of jobs and not having stimulus checks on making rent um but again looking at that housing market this is you know we do an annual uh, rent survey you've probably a lot of us a lot of you folks have probably heard about this um we've seen continued increase in median rent so we see that for our 2020 survey of two bedrooms which is the teal line of a little over $1,400, and that's gross rent, so that's rent and utilities, and then $1,283 for overall, so that includes studio, one bedroom, two, three, and more. Um, and again, to note, um, the last five years, it's increased 22%, so even with a good economy, there was a challenge because that's um, rent has gone up faster than, than incomes, um, and so again, impacting uh, choice and availability. And some of the, and so again, as the median is, you know, half of the, the units, the two bedrooms are, are, are more than 1,400 and half are under. Um, but where some of those that are more affordable might not be where you're trying to live and where you're working. And so um, the vacancy rate continues to be really low. We saw a slight uptick as we looked at um, our just our current rent survey. And just so we have a sense of context, this is turnover is about 3%. So that's someone leaving an apartment and it's vacant for a short period of time while it's um, cleaned and repainted perhaps. And a stable um, or more balanced market is about 5%. So a little bit of that uptick might have been, you know, there have been a lot of um, multifamily units that have come online. They're trying to meet demand. Some of those are in the affordable tax credit realm where it's maybe 60% of the area median income. But a lot of them certainly have been higher end luxury trying to um, you know, meet a market demand in that level as well. Um, but certainly no matter what, you know, I think the important thing is talking then about you know, affordability. 30% um, of your income uh, is considered to be sort of the benchmark for affordability. And so um, I've got some of the median income for owner occupied in the state of New Hampshire um, and then renter occupied. And so you see on the renter side, um, you know, when we go back to the median purchase or medium rent of a, of a two bedroom 
at about 1400, you know, we see a challenge here. And that's reflected down on the bottom. So there's about 30% of owners pay more than 30% on their principal interest taxes and insurance. Um, that's a little little bit different when we think about that percentage. Some some incomes are higher. You see 90,000, so 30% of a higher income. It's a less of an impact as it would be on something that's um, a little less than half that. Um, and this is kind of the way it is throughout the state. Renters tend to be the ones that are paying a lot more, so 44% of them in New Hampshire are paying more than 30% of their income. And I've seen that number much higher in different regions in the state. So certainly the pandemic has impacted the lives and the livelihood of people. Um, there's unemployment, even though that is rebounding. Um, it's you know created a situation here for owners and renters, but it's slightly different. And so many of you may know, uh, if you're if a federally backed mortgage, um, you can have up to about 360 days of forbearance to try to deal with coming out of this pandemic, coming out of perhaps um, one or the other income on a two income earner house is trying to get their, their job and employment back. On the renter side, as I mentioned, you know, um, the prohibition on, on evictions is, is over. Um, and so uh, that's going to be a challenge. Um, on the home ownership side, just to, to mention about two thirds of the homeowners have a federally backed mortgage, but um, the other third represent, um, you know, folks that have a portfolio loan with a, um, with a, mortgage, with a bank, um, and it also includes folks in uh, manufactured housing. You may have heard that the, the um, CARES Act, the $35 million was set aside for the housing relief program. That's available through the CAPS, and that's trying to address some of this impact of the pandemic and people losing their jobs. And um, so there've been a lot of inquiries for that. And I know there've been some challenges. It's a, there's a complexity of trying to um, make sure that a, a renter applying for that has the, the right criteria for getting those um, those dollars. But certainly I would be remiss if I didn't say, if you have any of those questions or know people that need to know more about that, uh, have them uh, reach out to a community action program agency or to dial 211. And so again, with joblessness, with the, the the challenge we had again before the pandemic of of being able to afford where we live, that can be a driver that leads to um, homelessness. Um, we talked about you know evictions and foreclosures um, can lead to maybe being in that situation. Through this, we know that shelters um, have really uh, been strained as they deal with maximizing as they have as their model to maximize the space to, to have people uh, for shelter. And now they're faced with the need to deconcentrate or find places to put individuals and families that may be infected and need to be isolated um, and in quarantine. And so, you know, what, it, what does that mean in terms of, and this is getting to maybe some of the impacts of the pandemic that, so shelters are looking at how do I retrofit my space? How do I look for additional space? How do I deconcentrate? Um, and then the other is, and, and also in the in the tax credit situation, so on the left is Kensington Woods. Um, so a tax credit project, that's Crossroads House in the upper right. Um, both have to look at that. How do we deal with common space? Um, how do we deal with air purification? How does the design and layout impact that as we look into the future? And this is going to be an important, I think, role for designers, for architects, for engineers to really be looking at that. I'm, I'm struck by just even in the restaurant, um, being in the Seacoast a lot in Portsmouth, you know, seeing um, folks that kind of came, architects that came together and a, a lot of people try to look, find ways to use outdoor space. Um, so some of that similarly has to be thinking about design here. Um, and this is where I would mention that um, there's a shelter modification program that just came online through, um, again, through the coronavirus relief um, fund, and about 15 million um, for uh, homeless shelters, emergency transitional, you know, domestic um, violence shelters to try to help them deal with that situation of deconcentration and maybe looking for additional property so that, and it's not necessarily to serve more people, to but be able to serve the existing um, population um, in a way that's going to be healthy and safe during the pandemic. Um, the challenge with that program is that it needs to be completed. So if you're trying to buy property or renovate, it needs to be completed by the end of December. Um, so that is a challenge that's being that's being faced. And I think in my conversations with um, with uh, homeless shelter providers is that you know the real answer is you know we need to be thinking about permanent housing. Um, and more rental assistance to really solve this issue and have people more stably housed. 
Um, but certainly, so the pandemic, you know, um, be a little humorous here where you know people may be looking for that other place to be um and i think it's important to note is we've probably all been reading articles about housing about density um one of the things that i, I know that we know is that um that it's not necessarily density but it's the number of people that have been in one bedroom trying to just make ends meet um and so density is really isn't a, it's a villain and it's not really how you're getting to work it's it's who you're coming into contact with when you're at home um, and dealing with overcrowding and i think that that's a, a real challenge um we are having uh we had russ tebow starting to do a housing needs analysis um before the pandemic and he was working on that and now we've sort of decided we want to do this in three parts and have him start looking at some of the impacts of the pandemic and then trying to look into the future um some of the long-term implications so it, it might be good to revisit this question um several months from now when when we're kind of getting a little bit more information about how this is affecting people's behavior we're seeing some of that anecdotally now, and certainly people with means are thinking about, you know, moving out of the cities maybe, or um, moving into their seasonal or vacation home. And I think that's what this slide sort of shows is that, you know, certainly the pandemic is impacting how we live, how we how we work, um, and and um, you know where we want to live. And um, I think, you know. The pandemic is one thing, but what we've all learned is that we don't need to be in our offices, most of us, unless you're you know, an essential worker or in some other place that's very place located. Um, and that sort of spurned some interesting things where people are now working remotely. Um, I heard anecdotally talking with folks from North Country Council that saw a lot more people moving into their vacation homes. And there's a, a, a real question that perhaps that may become someone's permanent home. And I think the longer term question might be, how does that population shift um, maybe impact the delivery of services there? Um, and that gets back to some of the efficiencies that happen with more dense living. Um, and certainly there's, that leads to, you know, a, a good land use plan for that, which leads to a good transportation plan, which is a part of this conversation. I think to note, there was an August 5th New Hampshire Business Review article that said New Hampshire ranks 14th um, in attracting millennials um, that are wealthy or, or, or rich, as they said. And those are um, millennials that are under 35. So this is a survey. Um, over 35, uh, under 35, I'm sorry, and making $100,000 or more. Um, I know, and this is a pre-COVID thing, so I know that we're an attractive state. Uh, certainly with uh, working remotely, that only might, um, I think, exacerbate that that demand, um, which is good for people that wanna do that, um, but it may change our housing landscape and affordability. And to that end, um, this was something we put in uh, our, our latest housing, um, market snapshot and um, this is sort of the top five of where do new hampshire home buyers come from you see the eighty three thousand dollar number that's people moving within the state of new hampshire uh, and then we've got the number of home buyers from other places so Ma massachusetts is a is a close second um, followed by maine then connecticut and florida um, there are more uh, um, certainly places that people are coming from and we're going to take a deeper dive looking at that data looking at before covid looking at after and trying to um just you know just see what's what's happening with respect to that is it we're seeing more people moving out um you know moving out of you know manhattan there may be an exodus but it may not be an impact as great there as where they're moving to on um, mass and you know new hampshire is an attractive state for people to retire to retire to already um and now with maybe a more mobile workforce, uh, it adds to that. So it's a good thing, um, it's a challenging thing, and it's some of it is, is pandemic related as it related to technology and, and not having to be in your office. Um, but again, you know, my point in talking uh, about this has always been that, you know, what has the pandemic taught us? I think it's taught us the, the same thing, or what we've learned from it is the same thing we've been dealing with, is that how do markets react how can we be innovative and creative to meeting the changing needs of people's desire to where they live, how they live, and the affordability of that? And that's been really a perennial a challenge. And I think the, the issues and the opportunities rest in some of the things here of, of really looking at if we want to uh, help to deal with this in a long-term policy perspective is to be mindful of the cost of trying to build things, whether it's development, redevelopment, the availability of land and how we maybe constrain that um, through what through acreage requirements, 
road frontage requirements, and um, certainly how we finance that, especially for um, developers, whether they're large developers or just small scale developers, how do they finance that? And how do we how do we recognize that and respect it and think of policy that can help overcome that? And that really gets down to regulatory practices. So um, I think that that's really important. And as we try to segue to transportation, as I said before, you know, the best transportation plan is a good land use plan. And that gets to how we are able to take advantage of different modes of transportation from walking to biking to everything else. That I know Scott will talk about and, um, and so will Sylvia. Um, and with that, um, that's it for me. And I know we'll be taking questions at the end. So thank you very much. All right. Um, thanks, George. And um, let me also thank uh, Robin and Plan New Hampshire for hosting these webinars and for the invitation to participate in this one. Uh, so in talking about COVID impacts on travel patterns, I want to break that into to three phases, uh, short, medium, and long-term implications, as, as George also discussed. But for short-term impacts, uh, I'm talking here about March and April, looking at the first phase of initial closures and emergency response. Uh, medium term, essentially beginning uh, back in May and extending out until uh, there's widespread availability of a vaccine. And then for long term, uh, what will be the ongoing impacts of this? What's a new normal going to look like? So let's take a look. Uh, next slide, please. So let's start with highways. Uh, the uh, chart here shows weekly traffic volumes on uh, NHDOT's permanent counter network relative to the same week in 2019 and uh, includes averages for five regions of the state, one specific location uh, on I-93 and Concord, and then a statewide average. Uh, and you can see that the volumes were actually higher than last year through February uh, and then dropped sharply in the second week of March following the emergency declaration. Uh, and that most of the regions dropped down to about 50% or slightly higher uh, of the volumes that they saw in 2019. And these numbers are pretty consistent with uh, drops that have been observed in other parts of the country. Next slide. So what do short-term impacts look like in the transit sector? Uh, on the right, you see weekly ridership on the coast transit system uh, in the seacoast. Uh, ridership dropped sharply in the second half of March, uh, as with traffic volumes. Uh, and Coast suspended its fixed route service at the end of March. Uh, they maintained demand response service to, to address essential trips, mostly medical transportation, uh, and other transit systems around the state uh, responded similarly. Uh, on the left side of the slide, you see an image of Portsmouth Transportation Center, and uh, this parking lot is usually full to capacity. Uh, C&J bus suspended their operations the last week in March, uh, their inner city service relies heavily on travel uh, to Logan Airport. Uh, Logan's employments were down over 97% in April. Uh, and a lot of the commuters that CNJ carries on a regular basis are in the sorts of jobs that transitioned uh, very well to telework. Next slide. So the, the impacts of COVID-19 on bicycling and walking uh, really have been the opposite of what we've just seen for um, highway travel and for transit. Uh, COVID has led to a boom in bicycling and walking participation uh, and also in bicycle sales. Uh, I think in suburban and rural areas, this has been driven uh, in large part by people looking for alternative exercise when gyms are closed. Uh, but also just looking for fresh air and outdoor time when they've been cooped up in their houses. Uh, a combination of uh, rapid increase in demand and also production bottlenecks uh, in Asia um, have created a, a shortage in bicycles uh, being available. I think most shops in New Hampshire were sold out of their entry level bicycles, say anything under about $1,000 uh, by early spring. Um, and most of them are backed up or have been backed up weeks for repairs and tune-ups. Uh, and you saw quotes like the one down here from the Herald that bicycles are the new toilet paper. Uh, next slide. So once we're past the, the early closures and triage phase, let's take a look at what's happened in this middle period where safety protocols are in place, but we're still months out from having a vaccine. So here's that same chart of weekly traffic volumes on DOT's permanent counter network. 
Uh, and you can see a rebound of traffic volume beginning in early April and continuing up through June. Let's pick out two of those lines, the green one for the lakes region, the red one for the North Country uh, that uh, didn't drop quite as low and have rebounded a little more quickly. Uh, George referenced for the lakes region uh, and the North Country city dwellers uh, with second homes moving up in the early spring and staying on. Um, and uh, I think also uh, in the North Country, and more rural parts of the state, infection rates have just been lower. And so it's had a, a lower impact on people's uh, daily activities. Next slide. So on the transit side, uh, Coast resumed fixed route service on their core routes in mid-May, once they had laid in a supply of uh, PPE, personal protective equipment for their drivers and put safety protocols in place. They resumed their full uh, route network uh, at the end of May. Uh, ridership is coming back. Um, I think as of July, most of the transit system, as of late July, most of the transit systems in the state were back up to 55% to 65% of what would have been their normal volume at this time of year. Um, on the inner city bus side, uh, those systems are, are not yet up and running again. Uh, I think in large part due to uh, anticipated uh, low demand. Uh, Employments at Logan, you can see for July, we're still more than 83% down. Um, and uh, most of their would-be commuters are still working from home. Uh, CNJ and Boston Express, uh, I think have both announced that they will resume service later in August, uh, but are anticipating uh, a slow return to their normal volumes. So next slide. Um, so, medium-term impacts for bicycling and walking. Uh, you know, the demand for bicycles hasn't abated. Uh, there's still supply shortages. Um, still difficult to find a, a modestly priced bicycle. Uh, shops are still out weeks in terms of uh, repairs and tune-ups. Uh, I think the boom has highlighted the need for uh, better capacity at trailhead facilities. Uh, you hear stories of parking overflowing at rail trail uh, trailheads. Um, you know, with traffic down and bicycling and walking up, it's also led cities and towns to experiment with repurposing street space. Uh, both of these images on the slide are from down in Massachusetts, uh, but Exeter, where I work uh, or, or usually work, um, uh, closed Swayze Parkway uh, uh, that runs along the Swampscott River in order to create additional space for people to be able to walk while socially distancing. Uh, Portsmouth and other cities uh, and towns have experimented with closing streets for outdoor dining to help restaurant businesses uh, weather this period. Uh, this is an image on the right from State Street in Newburyport. Next slide. So. Long-term impacts, what, what, uh, what are we gonna see for long-term impacts of all of this once a vaccine uh, has been developed and widely administered? You know, what's, what's our new normal going to look like and how's it going to affect our travel patterns? And as a starting point, let's look at telework. COVID has forced a, a massive experiment in working from home. And I think it has um, changed traditional skepticism about how productive uh, employees will be when they're not in the workplace. Uh, once a vaccine is available, certainly many employers uh, will bring their staff back to regular office space. Uh, but uh, I think uh, an increasing number of employers will uh, decide that they don't need all of their employees in the office every day. Uh, and uh, may not need all of their employees in the office uh, at all in some cases, and that's going to have some interesting planning implications. Next slide. So, uh, you know, an obvious one of those is the likelihood of reduced traffic congestion. Fewer commuters at peak hours uh, means uh, less congestion, means uh, potential to push back or um, forego uh, capacity expansions on major highways. Um, another is, is revenue. Uh, fewer miles traveled means uh, fewer dollars uh, going into the highway fund uh, through the gas tax. 
Um, the Federal Highway Trust Fund, even before COVID, was structurally insolvent. We haven't raised the federal gas tax since 1993, and uh, inflation has significantly eaten away at the buying power of both the Federal Highway Trust Fund and the State Highway Trust Fund. So I think this is going to force a re-examination of how we fund transportation, and it's revealed sort of the, the tenuous nature of our funding mechanism. Um, George spoke uh, about housing market impacts, uh, just a, a brief note about potential commercial real estate impacts. Um, we're hearing stories from larger cities about uh, major employers uh, re-examining how much office space they need with more employees working from home. Fewer employees working in downtowns means fewer employees going out uh, and patronizing restaurants or uh, dry cleaners or other downtown businesses, which could have impacts on uh, vitality uh, for downtowns. Uh, next slide. So it's, it's unclear how comfortable people will be returning to transit, uh, even with uh, strong safety practices in place. Um, you know, recovery may be less of an issue for public transit, where you have a larger percentage of riders that are dependent on that ride for accessing work uh, or meeting other basic needs. Uh, for inter inner city uh, bus or rail, uh, where uh, trips may be more discretionary in nature, uh, I think we can uh, anticipate a, a slower recovery in ridership. Um, now, COVID is also uh, going to impact transit funding. In addition to federal funds, uh, transit systems in New Hampshire are heavily dependent on uh, funding from municipalities and advertising revenue. Um, and uh, town and city governments, as, as well as businesses, are going to be recovering from the economic hit of, uh, of the shutdown from COVID for uh, some time to come. And finally, I think we need to remember that only 34 communities in New Hampshire have public transit. Um, and many of the rural communities in the state are dependent on volunteer driver programs, which form the backbone of access for older adults and folks with disabilities to be able to get to med medical appointments or shopping or uh, meeting other basic life needs. A lot of the volunteers uh, that do that driving are themselves older adults that are more uh, vulnerable uh, to infection and, and serious complications. And so this is causing a, um, a challenge for volunteer driver programs to uh, recruit uh, their drivers. Uh, next slide. So, uh, you know, finally, I think this boom in bicycling and walking that we've seen this spring, it, it could cause a groundswell of public support for for more trails and better trailheads and better accommodation for bicycling and walking in school zones and town centers uh, for uh, adoption of complete streets policies. Um, there's also a possibility that as gyms reopen and people get back to uh, normal routines that this, uh, that all of these bicycles that have just been purchased could go back in garages and barns and, and this could fizzle like the bike boom of the early 1970s did. So uh, being able to use this as a springboard for improving safety and accommodation and, and uh, moving towards a, a complete streets approach to our transportation planning is gonna require planning and advocacy work now. Um, you know, documenting these currently high biking and walking levels with counts, uh, more experimentation with pop-ups of uh, complete street demonstration projects, uh, and ensuring that policymakers understand the, uh, the need and demand for um, safe accommodation for biking and walking. And that'll require leadership. Uh, photo on the right here is British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, um, who, when he was mayor of London, was known for biking to work. Uh, and uh, he has been promoting uh, bicycling and bicycling to work actively as a public health measure during the, uh, during the coronavirus um, pandemic. Uh, he's also recently proposed a, a new two billion pound per year program to improve uh, bicycle infrastructure uh, across Great Britain. And whether or not you like Boris Johnson, it would be 
good to see leadership on this issue of that sort here in the US. So last slide. So I know uh, that we're taking questions uh, at the end. Uh, if you have a question that um, doesn't come up uh, on the webinar here, feel free to contact me afterward. Thanks very much. All right, wonderful. So again, this is Sylvia. And uh, when Robin first asked me to tackle the portion of what the pandemic has revealed about the connection between housing and transportation. I really wanted to focus on that word connection. Um, next slide. We've heard from George what the pandemic has revealed about housing in New Hampshire. Much of that reveal stems from where someone lives, whether that's rural, suburban, or urban um, settings, and the type of housing they choose or can afford. It could be single family home, an apartment, a group home, and these days an RV or even a tent. Next slide. We heard from Scott about what the pandemic has revealed about transportation in New Hampshire. And depending if you are self-sufficient or relying on others, during the pandemic, these connections between home and everywhere uh, may have abruptly ended, as Scott has told us about. Next slide. But regardless of where you lived or how you travel, uh, we all had to hunker down. Next slide. When we were first required to shelter in place, if you had high-speed internet, you learned that you could do everything from home almost. You could work from home and go to school, you could shop, you could even see your doctor through telehealth. And like the rest of the world, New Hampshire and my own office became familiar with Zoom. And we're all probably kicking ourselves for not investing in it. Next slide. But many New Hampshireites discovered the inequities in broadband, especially for those who live in more rural areas. In my pursuit to discover the status of statewide coverage, I was informed that funding for maintaining broadband information systems has stopped years ago, resulting in out-of-date maps. Knowing how computer and access systems change dramatically in short timeframes, um, even a few years of funding shortages results in large gaps of basic understanding of broadband systems. We know that various agencies have applied for grants, but these cover only certain costs and are restricted to specific areas. The reveal in this situation is that we need to develop statewide broadband improvement plans that study the extent of the problem. Next, please. Starting with short-term solutions, uh, we might be testing our own situation by going to our library and um, checking out a hotspot. Uh, that's that's a, an easy, quick system to use in case your, your own broadband system is sort of iffy or your connections are, are sporadic. And that's what I did for my own home. I increased my Wi-Fi. But strategies for long-term might include contacting legislators to endorse funding, conducting community surveys to better understand local connection issues, and working through local broadband committees to create communication districts. You may have heard um, on the news about Connecting New Hampshire Emergency Broadband Expansion Program which is intended to fund up to 50 million from the CARES Act to provide high-speed internet connectivity to many unserved New Hampshire properties. And we'll see how that works out. Next slide. Um, continuing on the concept of home and transportation during the pandemic, cars allowed us to expand our physical connection from our community we started to venture out for entertainment, a drive for a change of scenery, for business, 
for just even picking up a pizza. People got creative. We saw parades during graduations, car rallies, driving by senior centers, and pickup windows popped up everywhere. If you had a car and you could drive, life got better. Next slide. But as Scott pointed out, the pandemic revealed that many systems, including transit services, could no longer function safely. So if you didn't have a car and you were reliant on something else, whether that's bus or, uh, for example, what I'm showing here, which is a shared bike program, you were out of luck. For those who needed to get to work, who relied on transit, were in need of transportation alternatives, you might think that you'd look for shared bike systems, but every New Hampshire company, every single bike share company, either pulled out for larger markets such as VO in Nashua, or the company collapsed that part of their program such as Zagster, which provided bike share in both Portsmouth and Manchester. Next slide, please. Other states and other companies made bike share systems work. In order for New Hampshire to provide bike share or other micro mobility services, we all need to get together. New Hampshire communities, regional planning commissions, state agencies, any stakeholder that might be interested in micro mobility in New Hampshire. And we have to come together to create a strategy to attract a business to come here for really looking at not just our urban communities, but all our communities. Next slide. Next slide, please. So no shared bike system? All right, let's get your own. But as we heard from Scott, many New Hampshireites, if they dusted off that old bike and they needed a repair, it could be months before it was fixed. People emptied uh, bike store shelves. Bike stores were overrun with tune-up requests and getting your hands on the bike was difficult. The only thing that was left were the most expensive bikes, something you'd hope to open up on Christmas morning. Um, or maybe you'd go for Craigslist and find something. But those turned out to be sometimes a bit sketchy and they did look like they had just been dragged out from the barn. Next slide. The pandemic has revealed, regardless of the setting, whether that's rural, suburban, or urban, New Hampshire needs bike ped infrastructure to accommodate all these increased walkers and cyclists. We knew that local and state parks closed, which put an intense use on streets, sidewalks, and trails, um, because they were the go-to of where people wanted to go to get out of their homes, whether walking or on bikes. Sidewalk widening became commonplace for communities, regardless of the size. The take home reveal is that pedestrian and bicycle planning at all levels of government must be a priority and that policymakers may need to reconsider um, updating policies, reviewing funding mechanisms and reconsidering priority projects. Next slide, please. Homes and connections are especially important for those that are limited, whether through health, age, ability, location, or a combination of those factors. The pandemic revealed those prone to isolation became more isolated, that is. And across the state, we had um, a variety of agencies that reached out regardless and created critical connections during this time of crisis. Meals on Wheels has been one of the agencies that remain steadfast in delivering meals to those in needs. I reached out to two of the Meals on Wheels teams and learned that Rockingham um, Meals on Wheels provided services three days a week delivering fresh, frozen, and what I now know is a term shelf stable meals. In fact, they delivered 15,000 additional meals 
between March and May, not only to their usual customers, but to 434 new clients. This is so critical because this is one of those groups that helps those who are isolated or, or homebound to stay connected. Next slide, please. Another program I discovered is AARP's Community Connections Program, which provides an easy way to help seniors create a lifeline to an AARP volunteer. Next slide. And wrapping up, what I also discovered through our Volunteer Driver Program Survey through the Alliance for Healthy Aging um, Transportation Team, uh, which um, both Scott and I are part of, we conducted this volunteer driver program survey and that we understood even though transit systems were sidelined, many volunteer driver programs continued to serve seniors, vets and disabled and was one of the only ways someone might get a ride even all the way down to Boston for vital medical checkups. Next slide. When asked um, volunteer driver program administrators what they really needed, uh, funding and volunteers were their top answers. And finally, next slide. What did the pandemic reveal about housing and transportation? That seniors to stay safe in their homes, volunteers are so desperately needed to provide essential services, delivering food, uh, providing those rides to medical treatments and making that important connection just to know that someone cares. And that's it on my front. Sylvia, thank you so much. And thanks to Scott and to George as well. That was absolutely fabulous. Um, you can now, we're now going to turn to questions and discussion. And if you all in the audience want to open your audio and your video. Um, and Brian, I think, do you need to, to manage part of that? Um, and we yeah, can take a look gone. at some of your questions. I think while we're doing that, I think let's skip ahead to the end, to the next slides, and then we'll go back to the questions. I know this is kind of a change up. I'm sorry, George, can I ask you to um, forward the, for those of you who are interested in housing, and many of you are because you're on this call, I just want to remind you that Plan New Hampshire has the Municipal Technical Assistance Grant Program, MTAG program. We have just gotten more funding for the coming year, and we have increased our grant capabilities from so that they're now between 5,000 and 25,000. These go to um, incorporated municipalities across the state. You have, there is an application process, and the funding is used for you as a community to hire a consultant to help you identify your housing needs and then to take a look at your zoning regulations and to see, okay, how do your zoning regulations stack up against those needs? Do they allow it? Do they not? And so the consultant will then take a look and, and either create new zoning regs or rewrite some of the existing ones. Next slide, please. Um, also want to give you um, a save the dates. We are going to be, our fall conference series is going to be belonging by design. They're going to be um, these three dates and it'll be at lunchtime, it'll be a webinar similar to this. And we'll be taking a look at how design of our communities, design of our streets and design of our buildings, how we can make everyone feel included and feel that they um, belong in their communities. So stay tuned for more information about that. And next please. And thanks again to the folks who helped put this together. Just absolutely fabulous. Next, please. And again, the AICP program is this number here. So if you are getting credits, this is the, this is the number of the program to go in and get that um, and file your application. Next, please. And finally, um, show your support for this work. If you're not a member of Plan New Hampshire, and I know a lot of you are not, we really welcome you to consider becoming a member um, and or make a donation to plan and you'll be glad you did and so will we so thank you so much so let's go back to the questions now Brian what have we got great we've uh, received a couple of questions and um, just to remind everyone you can we have two options for asking some questions you can hit the little hand icon which will um, uh, it'll show that you have your hand raised and then I can enable your audio and you can speak 
um, or you can type questions in the uh, questions box and I'll read them and uh, we'll uh, relay them to the correct panelists. So we did Great. receive three questions, so I'll, I'll go through these um, to start with could right we, now. Um, so excuse the first me, one. Brian, could we, could we, could we um, close the screen so we can see people? Would that work? Do we see people if we close this, if we sh shut off the um, share screen? We can't see the attendees. We can just see the presenters. Oh, we can't. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, I could enable sorry. some people, but. Sorry. Okay. Um, not with this platform. So. <laughs> no problem. Okay. My so the first Go question ahead. was from uh, Todd, uh, Todd Horner. Thank you. Um, he says, do we have a sense yet of whether the $35 million housing relief program will be sufficient to meet the need? And I'm not sure if that would be George or. Or, or which one of you would take that? Um, I guess I can I can start. I think that's a good question. I know that, um, and I think when I maybe mentioned the statistics, there was about 1,400 or so applications. Um, I, I think the challenge is looking at um, what's what may come down the line with another stimulus package that helps to um, stabilize rent. I know in the President Trump's executive order. There's something about about eviction staving things off. Um, so that's a hard question. I know that people are concerned about it, um, but I think people are trying to see what's what's going to be the return to employment that sort of, um, I guess, makes that problem not as um, as dire. But I think the real real realization that a lot of folks in rent, they were paying rent, um, were really only one month of rent away, even when the economy was strong. So hard to answer, but I think it's certainly gonna um, see an uptick in the, the next month or so. So I just don't know if it's enough, but. Uh, great, thank you, George. I'll move on to the second question. Another one from Todd Horner, thank you. Um, he says, do we have a sense of whether vehicle accidents have increased or decreased during the pandemic? I've heard reports from other areas of the country where accidents have been up, even though VMT is down. What does that say about how we design streets and roads? Um, I don't have data on this for New Hampshire. I've, I've similarly seen uh, data from other states where with uh, many fewer cars on the highway, uh, we've had increased instances of extreme speeding uh, that has led to uh, higher crash rates. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, implications of that uh, for longer term, um, you know, for city streets, town streets, we need to be thinking more about traffic calming, uh, thinking about how we uh, design roads uh, for uh, not just maximum throughput and most efficient uh, automobile travel, but for uh, all travelers, whether people are bicycling or walking or waiting for a bus. So I, I think it's a good argument for complete streets policies. Great. Thanks, Scott. Uh, the next question is uh, from Katie Lamb. Um, she says, I found it interesting, George's comment on the rich millennial moving to rural homes and the potential of this being a long tread due to remote working being more accepted. However, I do not think that these millennials are the majority, and I'm also not sold on millennials wanting to live in places that chain them to a car. The most important thing will still be to create towns and cities that are walkable and cyclable. I couldn't agree more. I, I think it was just an interesting um, comment. And I think for me, as someone who talks a lot about uh, millennials and debt, I, I never try to, um, you know, pigeonhole what millennials are looking for. I think what we see is that as people grow older and their lives change, they look for different kinds of housing. And I think we need to have good sound policy and planning that allows for that to happen. Um, but it is interesting that there is a segment, and I even know before that article came out, some some apartments in Manchester that were specifically, you know, targeting um, folks like that. But you're right. I we may rank 14th, but I don't know what that actual number is. Um, I think for me, with everything we're reading, it's just this pandemic and being able to work remotely is, and even how it affects how we drive down the road, like crazy people, uh, getting back to accidents. Um, it's just it's really on. Um, 
I think on, on overdrive. And so it's interesting the things that are, are being reported and seen, but I, I couldn't agree more about the policy. Great, thanks, George. Uh, the next question is from Christopher Williams, and he asks, how do you think all of this will affect building codes? Hmm. <laughs> Anybody have anything to? Uh... <laughs> well, you know, we talked about, and George mentioned this earlier, was there's a, such a focus right now on air quality. Um, I know even in our own office building, we're looking at um, things that I've never heard of before, <laughs> like I, uh, air ionization and um, yeah, I'm not going to sound very intelligent here, but we're, I think things are in flux. We're all still learning. We're all still reactionary. And I think we may see a little bit of that in building codes. Um, and I think the the notion of, you know, uh, Katie Lamb's question earlier about creating walkable and bikeable communities, I think a variety of policies and land use regulations are all going to be examined as we continue down this much longer road of the pandemic. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, the next one is more of a follow-up to the accidents question from Christy St. Laurent and she says that she did read at the beginning of the shutdown in New Hampshire, the car slash pedestrian accidents were, and car slash bike accidents were up. So thanks for that follow up. Um, Todd Horner has his hand raised, so I can um, actually unmute Todd. So Todd, if you uh, if you want to speak, I think you still have to unmute yourself, um, but I'm happy to take some questions from you. You should can, be unmuted. Can, it, look, it looks like I'm unmuted. Great. Yeah, I was just going to re respond to the the building code comment. Um, uh, there, Scott mentioned how there could be a dip in demand for you know office space, perhaps other commercial real estate. So I'm just thinking, uh, you know, in terms of building code zoning, if if we're still seeing a, a hot, stable demand for housing, just it seems to me being flexible about uh, adapting that space from from you know office space to uh, land uses that are in higher demand like affordable housing yeah that's a good point I mean mixed use might become very popular or work play kind of you know work live I'm sorry units those might become more popular and more accepted even in smaller communities yeah, and I think I think that's sort of something I was trying to get to in terms of just, you know, looking at housing policy and seeing, you know, um, or just policies in general about how we're allowing for the opportunity for the market to react to that. Um, you know, I think of, of Rochester that has mixed use um, regulations, but they sort of relax that first floor because they've got a lot of vacant first floor commercial only space that may not necessarily need to be that. And so they've allowed that flexibility. And so if, if that is something that we see more of because of this or some other reason, they're sort of poised to be a little bit more flexible. And I think um, I just see that it's a, it's a city, but I see that as just one area where they sort of looked it up and said, you know, why, why do we have this? And is there room for flexibility? Great. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Could I just add a follow-up um, on, the, on the crashes? Um, you know, over the last decade plus, there's been a, a downward trend in, in crashes, most categories of crashes with the exception of distracted driving crashes. Uh, as we have more drivers uh, distracted by devices, um, whether those are handheld devices or in theory, hands-free, uh, the amount of distraction isn't isn't that much different from uh, studies I've seen. Um, and certainly with more people out walking and bicycling on the road, uh, you would you'd expect to see uh, higher crash rates. Uh, I think there's also reason to believe that while distracted driving crashes are the 
the sector um, that is increasing more uh, than others are increasing while others are going down, that distracted driving crashes are underreported. Um, so, uh, you know, further enforcement on, on driver distraction as well as on uh, speeding and, and how we design not even roads in the town center, but, but rural roads where uh, perhaps they're posted for uh, 30 miles an hour or 35 miles an hour, but they have 11 foot travel lanes that are designed for 45 mile an hour travel. So I think we need to be thinking about uh, narrower travel lanes um, and uh, wider shoulders and better accommodation. Great, thanks everyone. Um, Christopher Cross uh, has the hand raised. Christopher, would you like to ask a question? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm a resident of Newington. I uh, had to issue uh, the, the discussion on um, every time that we look to uh, create more affordable housing, it's an issue, a new more affordable housing, the issue of density comes up. And this particular pan pandemic has pointed us toward the hazards of density. Is it time to, if we're going to um, make things affordable by increased density, can we require things, or should we require things like uh, more space, uh, both indoor and outdoor be available, uh, multiple elevators, um, multiple common facilities, break rooms, laundries, barbecues, so that people have the opportunity and not just have a development that is in an attempt to get affordable housing, has packed people so close together that there's no way that they can be safe. Thank you. You know, it's not just how it's designed, it's also behavior. So I'm sitting in a hotel in Georgia. Um, I have a tiny room, bathroom, and I share a hallway and uh, an elevator and we make it work and we're socially di distancing or i should say physically distancing and we wear a mask and so i think to say that we need to really review the density um maybe that we get to the point where we're looking at multiple uh, elevators or um i you know multiple stairwells or a variety of access points, those sorts of things. But I don't think necessarily this is going to um, point the finger towards we need to make everything two acre lots or something like that. I, I don't think that's a fair statement. And not that you made that statement. It's right. just I don't want to uh, make it sound like the next thing we have to do is all be in single family homes when we can exist in smaller units. It just has to be well done. And I think, again, the air handling units that we've been talking about are really important. Like the first thing we did when we got into this room was look to see that we had an individual air handling unit. Mm -hmm. And I think when I look at the, the shelter modification program that, um, several of the applicants for that from the homeless shelter one that i'm talking about are looking at those air cleaning you know upgrading their hvac hepa filters and things like that but i just would want to add like i made a point of talking about density not being the villain and so i would just agree that you know living in a small i mean i live in a thousand square foot ranch it's single family detached on a third of an acre it's hard to find those to allow even that to happen and so yeah. I would I would caution. I, I think those are important things to think about, but there's so much information and research being done. I think you know, Sylvia, you mentioned that ionization thing. I mean, I was hearing about it. You see it about on planes. You know, that you can be in a room, and if the that stuff can work right, it can apparently stop the spread of of viruses. So that's all on the cutting edge, and I think there's a lot to be uncovered. And I'm reminded, and we've all probably done a ton of reading, but public transit and other places in the world where that isn't the hot spot for getting things. And so I wonder what we can learn from that. And I think Sylvia mentioned, it's like our own personal behaviors, which play an important role in all of this. 
and again, whatever policies we put in place, let's make sure something can actually be built um, economically to meet your end goal if that's affordable housing. Because we can't have multiple elevator stacks and less density and think that that will you know, maybe be affordable unless there's some other kind of assistance that's put into it. And uh, you know, the tax credit program is an excellent program, but it's, um, it's highly competitive and it can only you know, put a few hundred units on the, um, in supply in any given year. Yeah, I think the the biggest takeaway from all of what the research I did to prepare for this and what I've heard from both George and, and Scott is um, making every community walkable and bikeable because people don't just want to be in their home. They want to get out. We, how, how was it <laughs> after the first month or so of um, hibernating? We all wanted to get the heck out, right? <laughs> and... Now, and we realized, well, how do you walk on a sidewalk that's about five feet wide and keep a six foot uh, physical distance between you and the guy who's walking next to you or approaching you? And that's possible, which is why we've seen so many communities widen their sidewalks. And I think that will be a real difference maker. Agreed. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, this one's from James Veo. Uh, with households transitioning to rural landscapes, possibly on a permanent basis, I am fearful of the impact on the existing natural and working landscapes. If we provide services such as high-speed internet to the rural landscape, are we inadvertently providing incentives for people to build homes in the rural landscape and erode the things people love about the state? One way or another, technology is going to improve. Um, uh, I would, I'm sure that that is a concern, and I can't really speak any more to that. But um, you know, I think, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think in the world that I live in, there's so many such pushback in trying to pr preserve rural character that I don't know how to truly answer that without, you know, showing that I'm I'm very much a housing advocate. I think we always need to, um, I'm, I think of the growth and development round table where we always thought about, um, you know, housing and conservation being um, something that can live together. So I think policies need to be fair and protect that. But um, I think it's an interesting question. And um, again, it, it might just be that we just leave it up to those with the highest means that are able to do that because, um, I don't know, I guess that's all I can offer on that. Yeah, that's a great, great. question. Yeah. And we hear that a lot, especially when we're working with communities on their master plans is the, the notion of, well, we realize we need to grow because we don't want to stay a stagnant community, but how are we going to plan this and maintain our community character? Um, and I think all of that can be done beautifully. And that's, you know, working planning boards, uh, zoning boards with developers and everyone sitting at the same table. What, what, how is it you would like to grow and maintain this beautiful character and, or, you know, whatever the goal is of that community. Great, thank you. Uh, we still have a couple more questions. I think we still have a few more minutes. Uh, this one's from James Weatherly. Uh, he says, I've seen in other places, uh, Bay Area, et cetera, reports showing very tangible numbers of renters at risk for eviction as a result of the pandemic. Is that kind of data available for New Hampshire? Where would one start to look to try to gauge the number of at-risk renters in New Hampshire? Not sure where that reporting has. I know uh, New Hampshire Public Radio was um, hearing that from New Hampshire Legal Assistance, and I think they're they're sort of on the front lines of dealing with eviction issues. Um, I, I don't think we're at New Hampshire Housing able to, to capture that now. I don't think that we are, although I I can I can check on that. Um, so I think that's a good question, but I, I know when I was seeing that evictions were going up, I was getting that information um, sort of from anecdotal newspaper reports, including Dick Anagnos talking about 
some of his units, but we're early in this stage right now. Um, and I think that's a challenge, but I don't, I don't really have a good answer, but I know legal assistants seem to be, um, you know, noting that because they're dealing it from cases that they're trying to, uh, to work with to help, help renters. Great, thanks, George. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, this one's from Kayla Tavares, and she asks, do you anticipate increased demand for missing middle housing types to meet density, but in different shapes than a standard elevator service style apartment in and near downtown. I think I would say that that there's been pent up demand for lots of different styles and types and sizes of homes, and the challenge has been um, how a, how someone can economically do that, um, what's allowed in a community. Um, but I think there's a um, you know, anecdotally, there's been that desire. And when we think about in New Hampshire, when I think about the accessory dwelling unit law that was passed and then the opportunity for communities to, if they want to allow detached accessory dwelling units, that's, you know, that's an element of smaller, um, you know, separate housing that can help deal with a, with a demand and as part of that missing middle. But I think people are looking for that from everything I hear. Um, it's just, can it be done economically and do communities allow it? I don't know if Sylvia or Scott have anything more to add to that, but. Uh, I think you covered it nicely. It's really the allowance, what will communities allow? Um, yeah. I think the benefit of allowing it is if the market wants it, and by say allowing those five L's, do we understand the impact of the cost of lumber, labor, the availability and restrictions on land and the intensity of its use? Um, certainly be able to get equity or financing, and then what do we allow in our community? And I and I, I go back to, I just think of that because um, in communities that I talk to, sometimes they might be trying to think of another issue of how do we take care of our, our older folks and realize there are limited opportunities for someone to age in their community because they want something other than just the large single family on an acre home and that hasn't been allowed. And so I think that there's a lot of that demand and I think the benefit of, of continued conversation around that um, community by community will be really important in trying to assess what's, how do we, how do we deal with that? And I think we'll emerge with realization that people are looking for very different kinds of housing options throughout their lifetime. Yeah. I mean, mostly when I'm, I'm talking with uh, folks about whether that's um, age-friendly housing, so housing that's you know starter homes for young people, or uh, some the kind of the last unit you want to buy when you're a senior and you want to downsize. Those are really in demand and they're hard to find. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's considered part of the missing middle. <laughs> I just find it missing in general. Um, <laughs> And I, I think mostly people want diversity in housing and the, that particular type of housing is really needed. Any final question? Did everybody leave us? <laughs> I don't know. But as far as I just want to add, as far as missing right. middle goes, we just, we just gave a great um, webinar. It was actually a seminar on it at the, um, I think it was the NECAPA conference last um, November. And um, missing middle, it, it isn't just about, we want to keep in mind, it's not about building a whole development of this kind of home, but it actually can be, a, it's, a, it's actually a, a perfect infill um, type of, of homes is is this missing middle whether you have a the old-fashioned duplexes or triplexes which um, fit in very nicely and, and a lot of it is it's it, it has really more to do with what does it look like and how does it fit into in, into fit to the into the existing neighborhood Brian did we have another question we're getting close to time so there's, here there's no more questions but we have two people with their hands up uh, Julie and okay. Long, did you uh, have a question you have to unmute yourself. Hi, this is Julian Long from the city of Rochester. I just wanted to mention, um, George mentioned that we were able to um, 
change our downtown density limitations. And um, that was actually done through um, a municipal technical assistance grant. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Thanks, Jillian. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Great. And then uh, Todd Horner, did you have uh, additional questions? Todd's reached his limit. Yeah. <laughs> I I was um so I'm intrigued with this idea of um home sharing which some of you have probably heard of it, it, I, it there's you know it's more established I think in other states I'm thinking about home share Vermont which is you know kind of a established nonprofit that connects uh typically older uh homeowners that have extra space with typically younger people who need affordable housing. And I'm wondering if any of that is happening here in our state. Hmm. Possibly, but not maybe legally, I don't know. Right. So I know up in Mount Washington Valley, Marianne Jackson, um, who's a um, was really shepherding that um, home share and she was modeling it off of the Vermont uh, program, and I know I presented with her. I was presenting on accessory dwelling units. She was talking about that, and I, I think they were trying to work through the legalities of it. And I forget what some of those challenges were, but um, she certainly embraced it and had a popular or, or a, a strong following of people who were looking at that option. And um, you know, it's it's a it's a unique and maybe a niche for certain people, but I think it's worth being explored. But um, so Todd, if if you wanted to get more information on that, I could connect you with Marianne Jackson up in uh, up in Conway, and I think they were doing it through um, yeah, she's a Gibson Center coordinator up there. Great, thanks. I'll connect with you offline. All right, that's it for questions. Well, thank you all for being here today. It's been really great. These been they've been really great questions, and um, that's what I love about New Hampshire. We've got so many great, interesting people asking interesting questions because they want to get interesting things done. So thanks to each and every one of you again, Sylvia and Scott and George, and thanks to each and every one of you who attended today. I hope that you found it informative and enjoyable. Send me comments if you want. Um, just let me know what you think. And we do hope that we'll see you at Belonging by Design. Stay tuned for um, information about that. If you're not on our mailing list, we'd love to have you join. If you're not a member, we'd love to have you join. So thank you, thank you again for today. This was great. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.